Hello, students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker, and today's example is going to look at a Newtonian kinetic situation. We're going to treat the skier as a particle, and we're going to use Cartesian coordinates. The reason we use Cartesian coordinates is that the acceleration upon the skier is fundamentally coming from vertical gravitational acceleration. That gravitational acceleration is never changing in direction. Therefore, we can go ahead and use that as our, our basis, right? The, a non-changing acceleration doesn't change with the position of the particle on the path. And so we have this skier, and the skier has a mass of 100 kilograms. And she is going to slide down a 40-degree slope and after she's traveling 20 meters down that slope, it will have elapsed 2.58 seconds, okay? Now, one thing that we need to accept about the skier is that when she comes out of the starting gate, she's not going to push with her poles. She is just going to um, tuck down over her skis and slide down the slope, okay? I know that none of you probably would ever do that as you came out of the gates on some kind of a race, but that's exactly what's gonna happen here just because we're not going to incorporate that additional force that would come from pushing down that slope, okay? So a couple things to notice is that we have a mass, we have some forces, we have some accelerations that points us toward the fact that this is going to be a kinetics problem. Because it's a kinetics problem, let's go ahead and draw a free body diagram. Now I could redraw that skier, but it's really just as simple to draw a box just because that's how we're treating this skier is that she is acting as a particle. And the reason she's acting as a particle is we're going to assume that all of her forces are concurrent and we're also going to um, have her non-rotating. Okay, so here's the weight. Weight, of course, equals to the mass times gravity pulling toward the center of the Earth. Our normal force is acting here perpendicular to that 40 degree slope. And also we have a friction force, and this friction force is going to be opposing the motion. Now the motion of the skier, she's coming down the slope, and so this is going to be my F sub F, my friction force coming back up the slope. Now the acceleration, because we have a constant, um, basically a linear path, is going to be in this direction right here. We're going to call that the acceleration. And I've decided to pick a coordinate system, a rotated coordinate system, Let's go with x going parallel to the slope, but up the slope, and y going perpendicular to that slope. Okay, so this gives us all the different all the different terms. Let's go ahead and add in some angles. We know that this slope is 40 degrees off of horizontal. Drew this way too shallow, but this should be 40 degrees. Now you should remember from statics that if we have any line that is perpendicular to another line, and so our acceleration is made measured 40 degrees from horizontal, then it turns out that perpendicular to that, which is my y-axis, will be 40 degrees from vertical. Okay, and we'll end up needing that 40 degree angle as we work forward through the problem. All right, so we have our free body diagram. It is a combined free body diagram and kinetic diagram because I've included my acceleration. Noting that there's no acceleration in the y direction. That's Once again, that's why I chose this rotated xy coordinate system. All right, so I'm actually gonna start with some of the forces in the y direction equation, and that's gonna equal the mass times my acceleration in the y. And again, because I have no acceleration in the y direction, this is going to equal zero. And what I'm left with is that I have my normal force is positive it's in, the, in the y direction. I have a component of the weight force, which is going to be my mass times my gravity times the cosine of 40 degrees. Cosine because I'm looking at this weight force here and the y component is adjacent to the 40 pound force and it is excuse me the 40 degree angle and it is negative because it's pointing in the negative y direction so coming back over to my equation the right hand side i have this equal to zero so therefore my normal force is equal to uh, mg cosine of 40 degrees Okay, I'm going to leave it in that form for right now. I know that we know her mass, we know gravitational acceleration, but I want to take a look at if this problem is actually mass dependent or mass independent. So I'm going to leave that mass as a variable for right now. So now moving into my sum of forces in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x, 
Make sure you're not writing this automatically as sum of forces equals zero. And that was a good statics habit. It is often not true in dynamics. So now we have a component of the weight force, and this is going to be in the negative x direction. Right, looking here, we have essentially a component of this weight force which is coming down the slope, and down the slope in this case turns out to be in the negative x direction. So we can write that out as a negative mg. This is going to be the sine of 40 degrees. And then we're going to add to that the friction force. And the friction force is going to be positive. It's going upslope. So we'll take our friction coefficient, which is currently unknown. Take that times the normal force, mg cosine of 40. Right, That came from right here. This is the normal force. And this is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Now, as I take a look at this acceleration in the x direction, there's two ways I could um, interact with this. One way is that I could leave this as positive, but realize that if you're leaving this as positive, you're assuming that this is going in the opposite direction you have it drawn. Okay, Probably not the best way to do that. So instead, what I think is better to do is to go ahead and add a negative sign in front of your acceleration, just to highlight the fact that we are talking about an assumed negative acceleration from our free body slash kinetic diagram. So something to notice here is that all of these signs, this one, this one, and this one, all come from our diagrams. Okay, we pick a coordinate system, we add the signs that line up with that coordinate system. So another thing to notice about this equation is there's a mass term in every single one of these terms, both on the right and also on the left. Okay, So it turns out I can cancel these out, dividing both sides by mass. And so it turns out to be a mass-independent problem. It doesn't matter if she had a mass of 100 kilograms or 50 kilograms or 200. We get the same answer. And it turns out that problems which fundamentally don't have any other forces causing motion besides gravity. Uh, if it's a gravitational driven problem, it tends to be a mass independent problem. So we can find an equation a sub x is equal to now the values here inputting the gravitational acceleration of 9.81 because this is a SI problem and uh, using the sines and cosines there of 40, we end up with 6.31 minus my friction coefficient mu sub k times 7.51. Okay, so what we're seeing here is we have an inverse relationship between mu sub k and our acceleration, which is good, because the less friction we have, the more acceleration we should have, and that the more friction we'd have, the less acceleration we'd expect. Okay, so it's just kind of checking that out. And I can see that inverse relationship because basically on the left side here it's positive and on the right side in front of the music k it's negative okay and so inverse signs between those two terms so we still have two unknowns and so we need to reconcile what to do with those now as we get back into some available equations it turns out we can go back into our previous chapter so our particle kinematics our particle motion and then the question becomes well is this a constant acceleration or is this a time or position variable acceleration now, one thing you can do is you can look at the equation here itself, a sub x is equal to 6.31 minus mu sub k times 7.51. As long as the friction coefficient mu sub k doesn't vary with position or time, then the acceleration will be constant. And it turns out also that if, once again, if we have gravitationally driven acceleration, even a component will still be constant. Okay, So because of all that, we can use a constant acceleration and with a constant acceleration we can write the equation for relating the position the velocity acceleration as being the distance down the slope x is equal to our initial velocity times our time elapsed plus one half our acceleration in the x direction right not in the y direction but just in the x direction times our elapsed time squared. And then revisiting the problem statement, we see we have a distance and we have a time. 
and we just found this acceleration equation here that we can plug in for this. So what we're left with coming in with that acceleration is that mu sub k, right? That becomes the one unknown remaining. And so putting values in here, now observing that these are vector directions in this equation, okay? The distances are vector related and also the velocities are, need to be based upon our vectors and our coordinate system. So one thing to get rid of to, to clean things up is that she started at rest. So we can say initial velocity was zero. But as we take a look at this distance, our distance needs to be negative. The reason that it's negative is it's going in the opposite direction of our x-axis right here, which is going up slope. Now, if you had picked an x going down slope, then you'd have a positive value, but then you would also have different signs in your sum of force equals x equation. Getting over to the right-hand side of our motion equation, we have the 1 half, and here again, we have a negative acceleration. It's going down that slope. And so negative being minus 6.31 minus mu sub k times 7.51. And I'm going to come back to that minus here in just a second. And then times the time, 2.58 squared. All right, so realize that we made an assumption on the section above here that our acceleration was negative, right? We're showing that it's negative because it's opposite the x-axis. So this proved that we were right in getting this equation value. But then as we express that in our motion equation, again, we need to recognize that this acceleration, that this is basically the magnitude of the acceleration is going down slope opposite the x-axis. Therefore, I need to bring in this negative sign based upon our axis system, okay? So once I bring that in, then I can go ahead and work through the algebra, solve for mu sub k. This is equal to 0 0.0395. Now, if you are a skier or a snowboarder and you think that this was kind of an interesting problem, there is an amazing report that I found online. If you just um, Google search for friction between ski and snow, so that is friction between ski and snow, I guarantee you will learn more than you ever wanted to know um, about friction, about wax, about... Um, this this uh, layer in between the solid, quasi-solid um, snow and then also your ski. It's really fascinating uh, if you are into snow sports. So hopefully this was a good introduction to using a Cartesian motion system. We created a free body diagram. We wrote our Newton's second law equations associated with that. Went ahead and aligned my coordinate system with the slope itself. Gave me a zero acceleration in the y direction. Now, if you chose to use an x-axis going down your slope, that would change some of the signs in the problem, probably make it a little bit cleaner. Realize that on this problem, we could get away with a non-right-hand coordinate system. Okay, so that's saying that if you chose, I'm going to call this x prime. So if you do use x prime and y, it is a non-right-hand coordinate system because if we cross that x into y, your thumb goes into the screen. But because we didn't take any moment cross products in this problem, it would actually work out fine. So the need for a right-hand coordinate system is really pinned in to a problem where we need to make sure we're, we're taking the correct values for moment cross products. It turns out when you're just summing forces, there's no cross products, therefore it needs to be a perpendicular axis system, but you can get a little relaxed with your X cross into Y is in the Z direction. Hope you're having a great day.